Welcome to Hustle & Pro, talking sports from youth to pro. We'll bring you compelling stories from athletes, coaches, professionals, and fans, all with the common thread of something we love to talk about, sports. I'm your host, Kelly Walker, coming to you from Visual Learning Solutions in Frisco, Texas. Today, we're talking with a nine-year MLS player and two-time MLS champion. Before we get started with the interview, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor, then we'll be back to meet our guest and get started with this episode of Hustle & Pro. This episode is brought to you by I-9 Sports. I-9 Sports helps kids succeed in life through sports. Their leagues are perfect for boys and girls ages 3 to 14 with convenient one-day-a-week formats for practices and games on the same day. I-9's leagues and clinics are available in football, soccer, basketball, baseball, volleyball, zip lacrosse, and more. Learn more at i9sports.com. i9 Sports, the way youth sports should be. Let's jump into this discussion. Our guest is Michael Chabala. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So um, I mentioned at the top that you are a nine-year MLS player, a two-time champion, but can you give us, in your own words, an overview of, of yourself, your pro career? Yeah, um, I'm mean, originally from uh, California. I went to school at the University of Washington. I uh, got drafted in 2006, the first year of uh, the Houston Dynamo. I think originally it was called like, like 1946, or it was, a, it was a weird name. But yeah, so I played professionally for um, nine years and um, was fortunate to be on one of the best MLS teams, I think probably in the history so far, um, arguably, if you will, but um, where I played uh uh, for the Houston Dynamo, Portland Timbers, and DC United, and then finished my career back in Houston in 2014. So I have to say, you are the first Houston Dynamo player that we've had on. Most of who we're talking to, I mean, we're here in Frisco, Texas, so we, like, if this wall wasn't here, I could see Toyota Stadium. So we are in FC Dallas country, and so uh, I have a lot of FC Dallas players on this show. So welcome and you are our first dynamo player and and i you know after some guys leave here i follow them into their dynamo career like my my fafa i love fafa um and so uh, -huh. uh yeah so i'm happy to have a different point of view from an mls or former mls player on the show um before we get into that i do kind of want to know um before before your pro career started who were some of your yeah. sports influences as you were growing up uh i think the one that just stands out the most is david beckham I think just like any young player, you just look to the stars and see who's, um, you know, who's attractive as a player in your, your position or just who's getting the most attention. I love Thierry I love Pelé, Maradona. Um, but David Beckham for me was always my favorite and someone that I always looked up to. And, you know, being able to play against him in my pro career was, was a dream come true. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I, I would say him. So did you know, um, I feel like it was just really recent news that both two names you just mentioned, Thierry Henry and David Beckham, just made the cut for the finalists for the Hall of Fame ballot. Did you know that? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. I mean, I'm not surprised. That is. Incredible and, and there's there's Clint Dempsey and uh, several others that it's a, it feels like a really long list for finalists for a really probably short list that will that will get inducted. So um, that'll be an right. interesting thing. But I, I, I'm a David Beckham fan too. I have been for a long time. And I think that he's probably on the my husband's list of, of top influences here or also. So yeah, I like him too. So I hope, I hope he gets in at some point, um, whether it's this year or sure. not. Yeah. So you are known as a fan favorite um, when you were playing and embracing the community that you play within. So especially, you know, being a transplant from California and living in Houston and you stayed in Houston. Um, so tell me about those connections and, and what you've kind of built there in Houston. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I was on the, one of the best teams in, I mean, I would say the history of MLS um, team that won back to back championships. And I didn't really play a lot in the first three, four years. I mean, you're talking about guys like Dwayne DeRosario, Pat Onstead, Sue Holden, Brad Davis. Um, Brian Ching. I mean, the list goes on. And I learned an incredible amount. Um, more so that's probably helping me after my career, just because of what I learned in the locker room. But what I did take on was, well, 
I mean, I didn't really make a whole lot as a professional when I was playing in the very beginning because this MLS wasn't quite there yet. But for whatever reason, I just always felt like my network was my net worth. And so I really put a lot of energy into the community. I took on this approach of, um, I'm, well, I am guilty of wanting attention and, you know, trying to feel like a professional in some ways. So if I could get a free dinner at a restaurant or, um, you know, network my way onto a television show or a, a podcast or radio interview, I mean, I basically did it. And I think those relationships really helped me further along in my career and definitely um, post transition. But I felt like I was actually, I mean, well, first off, the team was leaning on some of the guys that weren't playing as much because they were looking for guys to be ambassadors in the community to get, get their brand out or name out. So when you're not playing as much, you probably have a little bit more time and energy to spend. So also being young, single, um, some of the other guys were older with kids, um, it just was a different dynamic. So I just really threw myself into the community and, um, you know, I think it was one of the, the big reasons, not necessarily for the success of the club, but I would say for the overall um, engagement, I would say more in the community. Guys like Chris Wondolowski, um, Stuart Holden, um, you know, myself, I mean, just constantly out in the community, Pat, Patiani. I mean, we were just constantly out meeting people and networking and it just really paid dividends later down the line. But that's how you have to do it. If you're not getting minutes on the field and they're not talking about you for that, then why not get out in the community and, you know, shake hands and do field dedications and charity work and all of the things that you have those the opportunity to do that most people don't. And, and then you right. can kind of still be front and center and a representative of the team without getting the playing time that you want. So I think it's smart and that you could leverage that um, because there are, I think there's a lot of players, I mean, just being around the team here as much, there's a lot of players who shy away from that and who aren't raising their hands to be poster, you know, poster models when a new kit comes out or whatever. But there are like these select few right. that we see every time. Like we see Paxton Pomacall and Eddie Munjoma and I always joke with them like that they're kind of like the models. And I don't know if they're being told to do that or not, but they're doing it. And so... Um, <laughs> I think yeah. that some people shy away from that. So yeah. for you to step out and do that, I do think it probably affected, you know, how people know your name later, especially like locally and how it, when you go on, there's always a life after soccer or life after playing. So, yeah, I think that Absolutely. you probably were able to capitalize on that later. Okay. So I do want to no, talk about. Was. I agree with you for oh, sure. Yeah. So I do want to oh, talk about um, the, the, like the, awkward or sometimes difficult dismount from playing professional sports. I mean, no matter what the situation is, when you leave from being a player to whatever you are after a player, it's always tricky and, and it can be hard in different ways, in different circumstances. Um, so I've, I've heard um, you talk about the corporate pass around um, that some players experience, especially in the MLS. And I, I want to get your input on that. What, what that. what do you mean by the corporate pass around? Um, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, one of the things in going back even to your last question or, or you know, comment regarding, you know, guys getting engaged in the community, um, I think it's I think it's a disadvantage for those guys not to because of like the opportunities, as you mentioned, like, you know, we can't play forever. It's like financial planning, right? Like you're investing in the future. And um, I think it was an old mentality of you know, the league and coaches just wanting players to really focus on the now and being really present, which we must to continue to keep staying, you know, at the top level of their game and our game and, and being able to play for as long as you possibly can, and especially if you're making the right amount of money. But when it when it's not that case, I think it changes. And I think just specifically towards like transitioning and that aspect of it, I mean, you know, how do you tell someone to find something to do you know, when they did exactly what they wanted to do for as long as they did, um, you know, and so it's really challenging for players to just leave the game and then say, okay, well, like, now what am I going to go and do? And there's not a lot of development. I know Major League Soccer is working, you know, they're, they're working towards a place where players can continue to keep winning off the field, but there's just a really big drop off. And I really felt that when I, when I transitioned. So, I mean, yeah. you, you bounce around, there's not really a, a good clear path of, you know, networking or not even networking, but shadowing or at least understanding what you're interested in doing when you finish. And Besides, so I think that that's yeah. a, a challenge for players when they finish, because what do you know? Soccer. So what are you going to go and do? It's coach. It's, I mean, let me just say this. The, the game is opening up so much for players now where, you know, it, you can find something that you want to do. For me, it just, I didn't want to 
coach kids. You know, I like, I love the pro game, but I was burnt out. So I've been able to personally find something that still, you know, keeps me connected to the game and giving back. But I did jump around through a couple of corporate jobs because, you know, that's what they tell yeah. you to go and do. And I think it's really challenging, yeah. at least for me, at least to go sit still and do something completely against what my passion is. Sure. So it's not your natural personality. And so you talk about kind of getting passed around. So you won back-to-back MLS championships in six, 2006 and seven. went to Portland in 11, then to D.C. in 13, and left the league in 2014. So after, you know, I can imagine building those relationships, then having to break them and move on, and then starting to build, and you don't know how long you're going to be there, and then you know your career is starting, you know, there's not a lot of Wondolowskis that are playing forever, right? So you, you know you're winding down. Yeah. And then you're done. The clock just, you're done. So was the ending of your pro playing time like a, like a dark time in your life and difficult transition? Yeah, my grandfather, grandfather passed away at 30. Well, my, my trade from Portland to D.C., I kind of really took a step back. I mean, at the time, I was only making you know, $60,000, $70,000, which you know, to a lot of people, that's a lot of money. And I mean, to me, it was at the time. But... I mean, I wasn't saving any money. I was, I was, I was in a tough spot. I'm just finally getting to that age where you start to realize, okay, like, what am I doing with my life? And yeah. this is great, but like, what, what does the future hold? And then my grandfather passing and approaching 30, I just kind of, the lights went on and I stepped back and said, okay, I love this so much, but I don't want it to prohibit me from having a future and a life that, um, that I'll be proud of. And and that's a really hard thing to to accept. And I think once that happened, um, you know, I I was let go from DC. And then, you know, I called Dominic Kinnear in Houston. I said, hey man, I'm out of a contract. I just come and train with you. And I just stepped back and said, where is the best place for me to transition? Because I already, I just felt it was coming. I knew it was gonna happen. And he's like, yeah, come in and train. We'll figure it out. I just knew I needed one more year to just get some money and also start figuring out what I wanted to do. And fortunately, you know, one of the players ended up going to Europe. There was a spot open that I played well, and I got a spot, which helped me for that year. And I just dug into those contacts. But um, the last day of my contract in 14, or the last day of preseason, you know, they didn't pick up my contract. And I was planning on continuing to keep playing another year. Um, you know, I went, into a, I went into that transition. It was a World Cup year, and I was without a team. And it was very arduous. I mean, I was suffering from – I mean, I was – I would say a borderline alcoholic. Um, I was severely depressed. I was broke. I was living on couches, um, and it was it was really it was really challenging. And I was a, it was a very dark place. And I say the hardest thing was that there was really nobody there for me. There was you know, major league soccer teammates, and I don't blame the teammates because they're hyper focused on their on their jobs, their careers. And you know, it's kind of a funny but sad saying that you know when somebody leaves or is traded from a locker room, it's like they die, <laughs> or That's... you know they're just maybe your best friend well, or buddy, like, but you know, you might keep in touch or see him, but it's the reality. It's like out of sight, out of mind. They're not in that, your, the, your rotation in your world and active anymore in your life. Like how you, you know, your life is built every day when you're, when you're, when you're competing. And you mentioned like you have, you have more time to do things like, like drink and not have to take care of yourself as much because you're not held to these high standards of being a professional athlete. So I'm sure that takes its toll on you physically. But, um, so I want to, like, I, I've read that you, you say that your true calling is um, hashtag keep the ball rolling. So I want to learn a little about that. Like, what is, what is the life that you've built now around soccer after leaving the MLS? Yeah, I mean, my, my greatest passion was always the locker room. I love the relationships and the connections that I made while I was playing. I you know, like I said, I struggled after my career. I was really heartbroken. It was really hard for me to be around the game. I, um, you know, was coaching kids like everybody else. And I really was trying to figure out like, what what do I want the next five years of my life to look like? Like, where do I want to be when I'm 35, 40? And I I love the game, but I just couldn't see myself doing that. I always challenged myself intellectually about, you know, I, I would like to, you know, maybe get into the corporate world, see what there is that's outside of football. And I mean, I worked at Morgan Stanley in the private wealth management um, sector. I worked at a private equity firm. I brokered natural gas for two years, and I hated every single part of it. I hated the suit and tie. I hated shaving every day. I hated being told what yeah. to do. And that doesn't I was just seem like a it. natural so fit when, for somebody like you who's played physically and you know been a competitor. <laughs> doesn't see doesn't seem like something that's just going to yeah, be no, easy I mean, for you to jump into a, a desk job like that. 
I, I admire and, and um, you know, all the guys that have been able to in some capacity. Um, but for me, it just wasn't, it wasn't it. I wasn't feeding my soul of what really makes me happy. And at the end of the day, I just act, like look myself in the mirror. It's like, I'd rather, you know, do something that I love than, um, you know, make a bunch of money doing something that I hate. And it just is really hard, like I said, to go do something when somebody asks you, okay, well, like if you can do anything in the world, what do you want to do? And it's like, well, I did it. And so I, I stepped back and I, um, was wanting to stay in shape. I just, I really wanted to, you know, make a run to come back and play professionally. So obviously I needed to work out and do, do something that was going to be keeping myself active and healthy. And so I started doing all these like workouts at Barry's boot camp and soul cycle and CrossFit. And, uh, simultaneously I was super lonely. I was wanting to meet a girl. I was wanting to make guy friends because all my buddies were playing and, you know, I was going to all these other workout concepts. And what I realized was number one, how disconnected our world was and is, um, you know, everybody is going to these workout concepts classes because they want to have the opportunity of meeting someone. Now, don't get me wrong. They want to work out, they, you know, they, they want to look good, but you know, you could go for a run. You could do a million other things, right? But like, why are you going to these group fitness classes? And yet mm-hmm. nobody wants to introduce themselves. They all preach like they're a team, a tribe, a club, a community. I'm like, well, let me, let me tell you what a team looks like. That looks like you putting your phone away. That looks like you shaking everybody's hand and walk in that locker room. That looks like you and getting to know the person next to you that's a locker room to me right so what i realized was this boutique fitness world was full of shit excuse my language and i just said you know what i'm gonna just and the workouts actually were below average in my opinion because i'm just a cardio athlete and um you know i just was i was wanting to be soccer fit if you will so i just started doing my own workouts and my friends just said hey can i work out with you i'm like yeah sure no problem and slowly but surely um you know Time just went on. I was coaching kids. I started working with the parents and I realized there was nothing in the market for soccer and fitness um, for the general fitness community. And I just really got excited about it. I love the idea of creating an environment and atmosphere that everybody would be welcome, regardless of your skill or fitness ability. And I was really motivated by a company called Soul Cycle. I thought it was a great idea, but maybe I could create mm-hmm. it for soccer. But what I really felt was, and the true motivation and passion for me was recreating a locker room environment so I could feel like I had a place I could call home. And I also wanted to create a business or an opportunity or place that I could help um, my teammates, former teammates in the soccer community, because I didn't want people to experience what I went through. And so at the end of the day, like I was outside back. I didn't really score a lot of goals. I scored two in my career, one against FC Dallas and uh, oh. one against Portland. You had to say that. And, you um, had to add no, that I, mean, in there. I got lucky. <laughs> I got lucky. I'm a Texas boy. You know, we're all from the same state. It's uh, it's all good. But I, I, I always created assists. Like I was constantly looking to connect people. That's something that I just really enjoyed, whether it was, you know, you needing a babysitter. And, you know, I know somebody that, that, that was looking to do that or a financial planner, or, um, somebody that can fix car windows. Like I just enjoyed bringing people together. Like that was just something that I enjoyed or, or creating assist or branching the score. I mean, so naturally that was just something that I was passionate about. And so when I started creating my, my company, I just naturally started meeting people and connecting people. And so it really was about the locker room. And, um, and that's been God sent. It's been something that's yeah. been helping me ever since finishing my career to be able to find something I'm passionate about and, and helping people connect. You keep bringing up the locker room. And I feel like off, up the, off the top, you brought that up, saying how the things you learned when you weren't playing as much, but you were, you were having, getting the experience and being in the locker room that you bring into now. So that yeah. is like a unique piece that you bring into it because most – I mean, a lot of people can own a Soul Cycle or a CrossFit and all the things you mentioned, but not many of them have that player experience and the locker room knowledge of how to like build the team environment and people that you can rely on. So I, um, I can imagine that's a big differentiator. So you haven't mentioned the name of it, but I know it's on your shirt. You want to tell us what it's called? <laughs> it's not that I'm doing it strategically like market. Like I just don't own anything else. Like I mean this. Like after every single trade from Houston to Portland, DC back to Houston, I just sold my car and then I like got rid of the clothes and I was like, man, I don't want to keep moving around. And I just, um, it's sad but true. I'm such a minimalist now, and I feel like I'm, a, I'm on a soccer team because like every single day I just rotate. Um, That's not sad. I think gear, I like will. minimalist strategy. I think it's great. No, <laughs> no and if it's your I business, it. wear I'm, it all I the love, time. I love yeah. It. yeah, people people make fun of me. I mean, literally, I haven't had a home in six months. Like, I live out live out of a suitcase. I lived in uh, Brickell, Miami, Austin, Houston. I'm in Los Angeles right now, and I'm, I'm I literally travel around. I I I go and work out. I play soccer with people. Um, 
network and act. I mean, that's that's literally the future that I created. And literally every single city I go to, it's just a bunch of teammates that are all getting together. But yeah, Sphere is the name of the company. Um, you know, and, and my uncle came up with the name and I just kind of told him what I was interested in doing and he was like, Sphere, super cool. And I- um, As I it relates to company. like a soccer ball. Is this part of, is this what it is? Correct, yeah, like the, yeah. it's right here. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the Pentagon is a panel of a soccer ball and when it's connected to ball, it's the world really in, in like a metaphor. So it's all about um, connecting the world, like, you know, one pass at a time. So that's that's the mission of the company. And I um, love it. I think it's- I just get to, you know, go to work on every day. I think it's so cool that you've managed to, like you, you said minimalist, but, and you travel and you're, you know, you're on the go and you, you're basically still like living that life of getting to travel and play soccer, but in, on your own terms, um, you know, the after the, yeah. the post life of yeah. being the MLS player. So I love it. I think that's awesome. Um, when you're in Frisco, if you're ever up here in Frisco or Dallas, make sure you let us know if you're doing any sessions here so we can check it out. Yeah, we have a big one of our biggest communities in Dallas, and Dallas is such a soccer city, and it's it's yeah. amazing. But yeah, um, yeah, we're there. I was just there last weekend, actually. I, I I love Dallas. It's it's been, I, I mean, usually when I go to Dallas, I'm in Frisco because you know the stadiums up there, so it's not necessarily yeah. downtown. But our community is in downtown. It's been it's great. But yeah, I love it. Yeah. I'm super grateful, and I think just I was never really a playmaker or a creative player, but you know, when you really think about like what you want in this life, you know, and you really put your mind to something, it's, 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 it's very true. As long as you can, you know, create it in your mind and, and uh, visualize it and just, you know, kind of put an application. I think the hardest part is just staying consistent, persistent, you know, and, and just relentless. And I, I just love entrepreneurship because it's the closest thing to a soccer game and to my past career. I mean, the, the locker room always changes. That, you know, every day is different. It's, it's a, it's a right. long season and just constantly putting myself in the shoes of myself, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was aspiring to be a pro, it's like, I'm like a promising freshman in college right now, but there's so many things that could potentially happen to the business myself, you know, that could prohibit me from making it as a pro, but like, I'm not there, but it's like just steps at a time. So yeah, I'm really good. Yeah. And that's exciting. It keeps you motivated um, to keep going and keep learning new things every day and building, building your business. Um, yeah, we tend yeah. to bring people up from the Dallas proper up here to Frisco for definitely for stuff like sports and um, soccer and football. We, we do that a lot up here. So, yes, next time you're in Frisco, we should meet up and do a do a session together. Um, I haven't played Look soccer in a while. I played growing up as a little bitty kid and then through high school for fun in college. That's how I met my husband, um, which which is good. He still plays for fun. And then I played in a women's. Yeah league when I was an adult, which is still funny going back. I think back to like, I cannot believe I played like as a grown up person, tried to play soccer, but it was awful, but we, we got through it. Um, so, and then the last time I actually awesome. played in a, in a soccer game was FC Dallas held a media game and I got to go out there and it was hard, really hard because they had former FC Dallas players, um, uh, a lot of former pro players out there mi mingling in on each side. And we were coached by the FC Dallas players. Jercory Hayes was one of our coaches. And um, I think That's Reggie fun. Cannon was the other. And so it was but when they were like the, like the beginning of their career trying to make names for themselves. And so I, don't, I mean, we hardly knew who they were at the time. But um, yeah, so I haven't played soccer in several years. But if you're ever up here in Frisco, well, I'll, I'll meet up and dust off my cleats. Uh, yeah. But thank you. Thank no, you, you for your you time, the, Michael. I, yeah. I know. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just saying, like, I think that was one of the, the biggest things that I that I saw was, like, and I, where I feel like I'm giving back to the game in this country specifically is because a lot of people stop playing in elementary school, middle school, high school, mm -hmm. and if they don't keep continuing to keep progressing, there's really not a lot of places to go unless you go play in a league or somewhere competitive. And so right. for me, what I realized was that people just want to be able to jump in, be able to play, do a little workout, have fun, and we're such a non-competitive concept like we say we're here to connect not compete and you know not like we're trying to hand out trophies and stuff but i just saw that there's nothing in the adult market for adults to be able to connect and so um yeah specifically to what you're saying i mean is just bringing people together that would never necessarily play and one of the best things is when someone buys their first pair of cleats or goes to their first fc dallas game um i feel like i'm doing my part to get back to the game that's been able to give me so much that's great i love it well, thank you for coming on with us. Um, I hadn't met you yet before this, so it was very fun to meet you and learn a little about your yeah, background. 
and what you're up to now. So appreciate your time. And thank you for listening to this episode of Hustle and Pro. Have you subscribed yet to our show? You can find us on your favorite podcast platforms. And now you can watch us. We're on YouTube. You can join us on Instagram and Twitter also. However you do find us, please like and review and share us with your friends. It's easy for you and it means a lot to us. We will see you soon for the next episode of Hustle and Pro.